and privilege to welcome you to a special session uh, with a gentleman who doesn't really need an introduction. Uh, BW Education and Business World is doing this in association with Adobe. So we have senior leadership from Adobe as part of this webinar. Uh, Adobe has been doing many initiatives to be able to be relevant in the digital and the creative economy. So let me first introduce our keynote speaker and a gentleman who, as I said, really doesn't need an introduction, but let me bring in Mr. T.V. Mohandas Pai. Uh, he's a Padmashri awardee. He's the chairman of Manipal Global Education, which, was, which is mostly known as Manipal University. He's also a former director of Infosys and head of admin education and research financial HR uh, initiative and also the head of the Infosys Leadership Institute. Uh, uh, I can go on about uh, his uh, contributions in Infosys, but more than that, he's gone in his role as the, uh, he's been the chairman of a management association. He's a very big angel investor. Uh, he has a uh, venture capital fund, which funds early stage startups. He's a regular, uh, on the TV debates, at least used to be regular till some time back on TV debates and is conspicuous by his absence in the last 30 days. So, as I said, a man of many talents to help you making some changes there with his leadership. So, let me welcome Mr. Mohan Das Pai to this Thank panel. You. Thank you very much. Welcome, Mr. Pai. Uh, we also have Mr. Supreet Nagaraju, who is uh, the head of uh, education and digital for Adobe in Southeast Asia and has, uh, you know, been doing pioneer work in the area of how to bring in creative uh, curricula in classrooms, how to make sure that there are no digital divides in the digital economy. So, welcome, Supreet. Uh, Supreet, I hope you can hear us. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you, uh, Prabhu. Thank you. Thank you so much, Supreet and Mr. Pai. But let me ask the first question to Mr. Pai. Mr. Pai, um, you know, all kinds of people come to you for mentorship. Students from all age, ages. I know your children have gone on to do well uh, and you mentor them too. Now tell us, uh, when a student approaches with you with a problem, how do you help him solve the problem? Uh, and how do you evaluate his or her creative or design thinking process? The word design thinking is lacking from our education. Well, Anurag, let me say that whenever people come to me, I test their curiosity and problem solving attitude. You know, whenever a person comes and talks to you, the first thing he or she has to do is to explain what they're trying to do. And then explain how they're trying to do it and what is the solution to the problem that they identified because they come for mentorship, they come for seed capital, etc. So I think the first two or three minutes, you can size them up by the way they talk, by the way they communicate and the body language and how excited they are about what they're tackling. So it's very important for people to have a very keen mind, a very problem solving attitude and a curious mind. To me, creativity is a result of a curious mind. Now, when you talk about creativity, you talk about people like artists, painters, sculptors, dancers, etc. Now, what is it they have? They have an innate curiosity about their art. Then they have an innate need to express themselves and they express themselves beautifully. Then they have an innate need to demonstrate a skill. Even though you are a born painter, you don't become a good painter unless you have all the skills that are required to make you paint consistently. Even if you're a dancer, you have to practice. Dancing could be natural to you, but you have to practice to get a perfect move and repeat it all the time. It's very, very hard work for everybody. You only see the result after they work very hard. But you know, it's very hard work. So when you talk about design thinking, <coughs> for me, is the process of understanding things on a system level. How does a problem exist in society? Why does the problem exist? And how do you solve a problem logically through various steps, possibly using technology so that you have a real solution which is available to everybody and which can scale up. So you look at it holistically and I would say 
you should develop the ability to go from the macro to the micro micro to the macro many people get stuck in macro whenever they come they start repeating oh so and so the big four said there is a 60 billion dollar opportunity everything as for the big four the 60 billion to 100 billion dollar opportunity you add all of them up they are much much more than the global gdp itself because everybody writes very great reports about everything but if they have a macro data they must come down soon to the micro as to how to solve the problem for an individual for example let me give you an instance of design thinking and how people did it payments what are the problem about payments you have to go to a bank you have to give a check and the check has to be cleared if it is outstation it goes for clearing and comes back after a few days if it is the same bank you have to wait they have to check up against your balance and they got to give you money now somebody came up with this beautiful idea of an app you download the app you enter your aadhar number you enter the amount and you enter the aadhar number of the recipient and you press click and the money goes immediately in 30 seconds is a beautiful system thinking is a beautiful design thinking right but behind that is all the hard work because they have to link your uh, mobile to your account they have to link your aadhar to your account then when you click on the money that has to go it goes to your account checks up the balance and from the balance it goes to the clearing house where your bank has got an account so it passes to the core banking of the bank and when the clearing house is goes to the bank of the recipient and the bank of the recipient is known because he has linked aadhar to his bank account number you don't know his bank account number and from there it goes to his account all in 30 seconds it just flows through the system so you have to create a system which is a flow through and which tackles all this but as far as i am concerned the user i only have to do two or three things and it's so beautiful so i don't know i don't have to imagine what has to be done behind now that is true design thinking that is true creativity because you come out with a solution which solves the problem and this kind of a solution today has 2 billion payments made every month 2 billion right now i think thousands and thousands of payments are being done as they talk so when somebody comes to me i look at the innate curiosity question them about things and talk to them they have to explain the first 2 or 3 minutes and to explain something complex in 2 or 3 minutes you must make it simple you know at infosys muti used to tell me that a good business plan or a good business strategy is something which if you wake up a person at 3 in the morning he can explain to you in 1 minute that means if you use complex jargon like uh, possibly your professor taught you anurag in your uh, mdi strategy class or whatever it is and you talk a lot about it you don't know the problem so you should be able to express yourself you should be able to make it very simple and tell people so i look at curiosity the ability to think the ability to explain and uh, what they're doing and then i talk to them and then it goes on thank you mr pai for giving us such a eloquent uh, uh, input into how you evaluate a student and what is needed you rightly said it needs to be simplified you gave a beautiful example of the payment solution and how uh, a design thinking resulted into solving a problem young professional billionaires that you're looking to recruit what are the two top qualities you look at in those professionals before you hire them so preet what are the two top qualities that you see in professionals that come to you for jobs what are the two two top skills needed uh, uh, to succeed in today's post corona world the digital economy yeah so uh, first things first which uh, i think i heard uh, and i completely subscribe to what uh, mr pai said ability to simplify and break through the problem problem solving aspect of it very very clearly second most important part of it is to look at uh, attacking a particular solution the how part of it you know in a very creative way because you know uh, what got you here won't get you there is a new mantra of the industry right you know uh, you may be a great problem solver till now in a particular way but today's uh, you know problems are multitude and uh, same solution won't fit everybody's shoes you know one one shoe doesn't fit all so you need to look at different ways of addressing a particular uh, you know problem for different category of people you know just to give you a small example hyper localization you know you know in in the context of media today you know is paving way for uh, so much of 
collaboration you know in the uh, tier 2 tier 3 markets across uh, the uh, entire length and breadth of the country you know uh, well, let me take an example of paytm it paytm today is now available in multiple languages right cricket at one point in time was available only in one language which was hindi today hotstar has gone into democratizing the entire uh, you know uh, commentary part of it in local languages it's available in kannada it's available in telugu it's available in kerala uh, you know the malayalam language then it's available in uh, you know uh, the assamese as a language in different some eight eight to nine different languages that are available today and what does it bring in it brings in a hyper localization it it brings in a lot of uh, you know opportunities for advertisers to reach out to multitude of people at the same time you know it's bringing the country together and, and it's uh, addressing the problem of the lowest common denominator in the society at large thank you we can't hear you anurag you are breaking up and you know since this I'm surprised. Let me ask you this: Since Supreet is not able to hear me, how, what is the changes that educational institutes? This is a question to both of you. Can do to make sure these new skills, and new attitudes, and new uh, ways of doing business are inculcated. Uh, so, what a uh, you know, new education policy emphasizes everything to be multi-dimensional, not be uni-dimensional. So, give us what can the schools do. to make sure that they prepare the kind of professionals that you are talking of you know uh, anurag if you look at schools what does a child do when it comes to a school when a child comes to a school is a voyage of discovery the child's brain is plastic till the age of 8 the child observes through his eyes through his you know hears through his ears and it assimilates in his brain and the brain records everything because the brain is very plastic till the age of 8 and absorbs everything just by observation and learning what others are doing so you go to a classroom where you can be put into a class where there is somebody who tells you what to do so you get regimented but a child's mind is curious a child asks so many question look at the natural phenomena looks at the sky and says why is the sky blue now you would never have asked the question unless you were a child then looks at a bird and say why did the bird fly now you'll never ask the question right because you know your mind is filled with many things why is the tree green now how do we answer all the question because the child is asking very basic question he seeing it is curious and wants to know the reason now when the child is subject to regimentation it stop thinking it does what you're told to do it loses all its creativity because creativity comes when you question and do something which is not there and the child becomes a regimented entity limited to a book limited to a question paper and uh, you know Uh, becomes like anybody else so you beat the mind of the child out of shape into something that you want that is the model of the industrial revolution because before the industrial revolution they were the gurukuls and they were the academics in greece where you went to a teacher the teacher taught you one on one by debate by discussion by explaining etc and there was a lot of questioning happening the child is to exercise his brain and the child is to ask questions and there was curiosity and that's why you could create a great product because people have to think keep thinking the ability to think the ability for your neurons to connect the various piece of information store it and, and create it and come out with a lateral thinking is something that a human brain can do and is amazing but that should not be shut out by rigor so when you go to a school the challenge today is is a very controlled environment the child is not free to do how to learn the child loses the enjoyment of learning and discovery because learning is discovery and the joy of discovery is enormous remember when the children go for the first flight they're so very happy they're jumping up and down looking out of the sky and looking out of the plane and you know ask looking everywhere and wondering what is because it's very new right there's discovery go to the airport there's discovery and the spirit of discovery is what makes everybody creative because the spirit of discovery makes you see new things so i think the new education policy understood the rigidity of the system is a very rigid system the too much is being taught to children at a very young age they're not allowed to discover there is no creative scope in the creative arts which exercise uh, parts of your brain and then at the end of it you have an examination then there's an examination fever and there is a overload of data which you don't require anymore because data is easily available if you teach a child to 
google it out you know the child will discover much more than what you want so what is the need to memorize and put it in your mind yes some things you need to memorize because you have to do maths in your head that's the best way even though some people don't accept that so i think in the school system now the new education policy says up to the age of 8 that is you know class 2 2 years before you go to school 3 years before you go to school and 2 years after you go to school at the age of 6 it will be like play to play you learn and that's the time when your curiosity is satiated and then from class 3 onwards till class 5 you have some formal stuff and then start a little bit more formal stuff the vocational education there is creative arts and there is a lot of discovery and then you travel to your society around around where you are to understand how society works and then of course there could be an examination so it's very flexible is very intuitive it is self learning is exposure and lot more interaction less content less examination and more freedom and that will hopefully make a child very very creative because today let me tell you anurag when we you know when i was data hr we hired 200000 people in 5 years trained 250000 people we used to get 3 million people apply for a job we used to hire 30 35000 a year what did we look for we look for them to be in the top 20% of the class why is that is the gating criteria otherwise you won't be able to do anything second consistency in the tri- academic records just to make sure that they capable of hard work third we gave them problems to solve and check their problem solving ability so analytical thinking and logical capability is what we did one part is creative one part is logical and by having what is called learnability the ability to draw generic inferences from specific instances and the ability to be able to analyze we hired them based on small tests and a discussion and they did extremely well they were top of the class and i think it worked very well for us so employers today after you finish your degree look for creativity look for multitasking look for ability to connect the dots across various areas because they wanted to be problem solvers so i think the new education policy allows all that in schools by reducing the curriculum load by reducing the things that you have to read giving much more flexibility allowing a child to grow up at his own pace we heard of many people till the age of 10 didn't open their mouth didn't do maths and suddenly became geniuses right so because people grow up at a different pace there's no one single pace for everybody so the flexibility has been put so i would advise schools to have a look at the new education policy reduce the stress in the system reduce the load in the system give more child time to the child to discover more time to talk to the peers and more time to grow up naturally i would like to ask the same question to you before i encourage you to ask some questions to mr pai uh, what what do you think the educational institutes can do better well i think uh, uh, the fundamental aspect of uh, you know institutions is, is always to ensure that we create a better learning outcome so you know when it comes to outcome the fundamental aspect is Uh, to understand the fact that learning is not a spectator sport you know we need to get out of the spectating you know as a basic quality you know it, it's an engagement it's a collaboration you know and i think the new education policy is is uh, encouraging universities and higher education institutions and even schools to look at engaging students and that that's how you know uh, students and uh, budding professionals learn uh, that's the first aspect of it the second aspect of it is to uh, unlearn and look at new ways of engaging students you know some people are learners of text some people learn by visual mediums some people uh, learn by audio some people learn exclusively by you know narrating certain things across storytellers as an area so allow them you know as mr pai was mentioning you know different people learn in different uh, age brackets different uh, time zones in their careers across so figure out customization in the way in which they would like to learn, you know learn things the last but not the least uh, is the fact of practical uh, you know activities to be embedded in the curriculum today our uh, indian you know education system has been uh, essentially 90% theoretical and 10% practical in the institutional aspect of it so when they actually come to the uh, real world it's the other way around it's 90% uh, you know uh, practical and about 10% theoretical in, in nature right so you need to be able to uh, strike a fine balance between uh, theory and versus practical and, and expose them more towards problem solving abilities at an early stage and allow them to fail failure is not a bad word and and and, and it's not a bad uh, you know sequence either and the quicker they fail the quicker they would succeed in their uh, career and, and and above all of these is the ability to uh, ensure that 
uh, the uh, we kindle a thought of creating something new and not just following what already exists or the spirit of entrepreneurship spirit of innovation needs to be embedded in every child and and every child is born uh, unique they have their abilities to create something brand new and that's what uh, you know we as uh, you know a country as a society and a civilization have have always been thriving upon it just like you know, we just need to kindle them at, at the early age and uh, give them that necessary space freedom uh, to go and uh, you know exhibit their talent thank you so much supreet you right failure uh, was defined by randy posh in his book the last lecture he said experience is what you get when you don't get you what you want and he said there's nothing called failure a project fails an idea fails an initiative fails a person never fails uh, uh, i would encourage you to please that you ask questions to mr pai thank you a lot uh, mr pai um, absolutely uh, you know a great pleasure and an honor to you know be with you say this uh, you know few points across uh, one of the points that i actually keep uh, hearing from lot of uh, institution is how do i prepare my students for a career which probably doesn't even exist today which is a you know a typical million dollar challenge that a professor who has been preparing students for success but at the same time you know also faces a dilemma saying that you know hey what got me here may not get me there as an area you know you know supreet that's a very important question to ask today when change is so very rapid and change is constant right and we are in the technology era the digital era where things are going to change extremely rapidly and the knowledge that you so have today you. may not be the knowledge that will stand you in good stead maybe 2 or 3 years later correct so i think we have to go back to first principles now who is a person who is creative who is a person who will succeed always look at all the great minds what do they have they have curiosity to learn they are curious they want to learn they ask questions they want to learn they have learnability what is learnability an ability to look at many things and draw generic inferences why do some things work there are some principles that you can draw third they have a problem solving attitude again and again i come back to the same thing they can analyze their problem in the mind look at something and say hey why can't you do something like this right if you whether you are a lawyer you are an accountant you are a indian designer you are a you know maybe a graphic designer whatever you are you know the ability to ask the question why can't you do like this that means what you identified a problem you got to do it and then insatiable energy where does the energy come from the energy comes because you're discovering something new the joy of learning and the joy of learning comes because you have the freedom to learn what you want to learn all of us have got specific specific interest we are not interested in too many things we interested in some things and that interest is very deep rooted right so if you create an environment for everybody where people can learn people can do many things they want or within the job whatever they think they can succeed give them the space uh you know give them the ability to come out with uh, you know solutions to many things then you're going to create a self learning self sustaining ecosystem in every corporation and if you do that people will learn by themselves and you challenge them because when you challenge them they learn and for all of us in corporate life supreet after the first 3 or 4 years when you do many things we get bored we want to do something new that's why you have something called job rotation right you rotate jobs to make sure that people are fresh and people can keep learning and also after a long period of time you know you get tired of doing the same thing right and so you are pushed up the ladder to make sure other people can do because once you do something it becomes a process and uh, everything falls in place and in organizations creativity and innovation is stifled because because the tyranny of the process because an organization innovative it grows because you know it has found new ways of doing things then it puts into a process for repeatability and suddenly the process becomes kills the soul process triples innovation so you got to make sure while process is important the tyranny of the process does not kill you so there's got to be this kind of flexibility it can happen in many areas of course in some in many very many areas you do the same work again and again and again because that's what the job demands you can't help it but everybody can't be creative everybody can't be something else but when you are in a fast fast moving area in the digital era the most important thing is learnability curiosity and a problem solving attitude today supreet you know and you people do it there are a lot of tools available to be creative what earlier took time the grunt work has been reduced substantially by the kind of tools that are there simulation 
the kind of graphics that you can work with in technology and GUI and the main thing else. And all the tools are made by people like you too, right? So the grunt work that was there about doing new things has reduced. Just imagine you want to design a car. You've got software that can design the car. You can design five cars in maybe four days and you can destroy the car by non-destructive testing. You can make the car run, speed up to 200 kilometers, see the impact on the engine. You can simulate a lot of stuff, which earlier took you days and months and years. Now it only takes you a few hours because a lot of tools are available to improve productivity. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you've been on both the boards, sir. You know, you've been part of the board uh, of one of the most coveted and the fastest growing industry, you know, in, in emphasis. And, you know, you've now on the uh, leadership uh, for one of the most coveted, uh, you know, university in the country and probably in the world. Now, the the thing that comes to my mind, you know, both as a parent and a potential, uh, you know, uh, person who would probably want to enter into a uh, university is, what are the industry trends that I need to follow? You know, when, when you look at current uh, growth, you know, uh, Growing core is, you know, is, is not just one. There are multiple uh, areas in the industry which are growing really fast. So, which are the top industry trends that that would make significant impact? And what is it that if I were a student who is probably entering from a university like Manipal, what is it that I, I should probably plan for? How do I plan my career across business and industry trends? Well, Supreet, I think the most important thing for us to understand is to follow our dream and understand what is interesting for us. What do we like? Uh, do we like uh, history? Do we like geography? Uh, do we like uh, design? Do we like uh, writing code? Do we like something else? So we have to first decide what is it that we like and try to follow the path which you like because when you like something, you enjoy doing it, you're much more productive and much more competitive. And that enjoyment comes much better than anybody. I think that's important. So you choose your area of specialization, area of interest, and don't go everywhere else. Second important thing is, you understand how to be successful in that particular area by making yourself productive. I think in the future, productivity is important because things are going to change. And productivity comes in when we can use a lot of tools that are available, because today you don't have to do all the things again and again and again, because you know, a lot of things are getting automated. You're going to have AI and machine learning come in and the world is going to be very different. But the future is going to be automated. That is a trend. And that's going to happen for the next five, 10 years. The future is going to be digitization in every facet of work. The future is going to be a lot more of use of technology in every area of the world. Now, these are all generic inferences. Now, I can draw all of them in my specific work. For example, I want to be a civil engineer. Now, how do I use technology and digitization and all the tools to make myself a better civil engineer? Design buildings better, design structures better, build it better, be more productive, be more competitive in the marketplace, correct? So I yep. think the important thing is to grow some generic skills and the skills should be to use technology and to use the tools that technology provides and then get some domain and understanding in any lines of business. And the domain and understanding of any lines of business is substitutable because substitutable means today, you can be an automobile engineer because you like doing automobile engineering. Three years later, you don't want to do automobile engineering, you want to be a civil engineer. Well, can you do that? Of course you can do that. Why? Because there's nothing very different from understanding logic and understanding how to solve a problem. And after that, you want to become a vehicle designer. Well, you can be a vehicle designer. So there can be a lot of things that you can be. The key thing in future, in the time of rapid change, the rapid technology, is to have a flexibility to do many things. And that flexibility, again, boils down to curiosity, learnability and your problem solving skills. So I would advise every student to start thinking, what is it that interests them? What field of study and go do that. Not don't go where your parents want you to go. Yes, you got to listen to your parents. They make important choices for you, but you can always debate and argue with them and then learn the skills that make you very productive. Because to me, the skills are extremely, extremely important. And today you ask any young person who is 14, 15, they're fully digital. Some of us look like uh, historic relics. And you know, because you know, we don't use the same kind of tools, right? We get stuck with technology. They do things so easily. They can do things so very fast. So those tools are going to be important and they're going to be much, much more important. So I will advise them, learn all the tools uh, which are available to you, which will help in your work. Uh, sir, in the beginning of your conversation, you did 
mentioned about design and innovation and design led innovations are actually the name of the game in many of our uh, revolutions that are happening in the industry today and the need for uh, innovation is more pronounced under the current circumstances as well you know if i want to look historically resurgence uh, you know in the time of crisis in the past in us also has always led to digital and creative uh, innovations as an area how do you uh, you know bring about these kind of innovations in a university setup where while we have certain you know goals from a learning standpoint but at the same time how do you bring about these kind of innovations and in 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 different formats in the university systems you know my elder son went to stanford he did double e he did very well he told me about the stanford process where professors come and talk to you and then give you projects to do and then for entrepreneurship they had something called stanford ignite what is stanford ignite they take you to a intense maybe 2 3 week course where they teach you all the things that help you in becoming a good businessman in technology or whatever it is marketing sales hr finance etc then they teach you how to use innovation of course you got to think of solution by posing problems to you and asking you to form groups and come with a solution so you start thinking how to ideate how to come with ideas how to do many things correct and i think that's extremely important because the key to everything is thinking thinking and understanding in your mind you can imagine the new world in your mind right you can see many things in your mind and you can imagine and all that imagination can be put down on paper and can be put down on a screen right and then they tell you that you know come and explain to you this idea you explain the idea and they give some money and say go try it out so you try it out because understanding something and doing something and doing it somewhere else is a very different thing like you said so i think in a corporation you can create innovation and help innovation by understand by creating an open transparent collegial system open transparent collegial system where there is sharing there's communication and new ideas flow where you are not stuck to a routine you are allowed to ask questions etc and in that particular system when you do your work you know you get new ideas and you should have a place where you can go with the new ideas and the ideas look appealing or maybe the idea looks workable somebody gives you a break and ask you to work on that idea even if the idea does not give you a break they give you enough time to work on that idea and come with a solution so what is important to create innovative organization is flexibility is openness is transparency and a culture of communicating up and down and respecting everybody's views of course you should be accountable for actions and for results because it just cannot be goofing off uh, is very important because you know it's a commercial enterprise and you all get paid well so you got to be extremely careful that money is not wasted but nevertheless this culture uh, creates a much more innovative and uh, uh, you know culturally uh, uh, culturally alive organization now when you talk about design we need to understand supreet that today we are in a consumer society in a consumer society people have choices and innumerable choices you go to the coffee bar there are some 25 different kinds of coffee we had only some three kinds of coffee okay we had filter coffee we had something else and black coffee right coffee with milk and the coffee with no milk <laughs> you talk about it now you got 25 different kinds of coffee you don't know what to choose right you go to an ice cream parlor you got 40 different kinds of ice cream what does that mean that means a way of selling today we are doing business is giving consumer choices and the choice that you and i make as consumers depend upon the visual appeal of the product or the service the ease of using that and possibly the taste or something like that if it's a real product and you want to eat something right that means the design of the entire thing becomes extremely important how does it look what is the ease of use etc look at uh, uh, you know ipad you know i was cfo of infosys i never carried a laptop i didn't like the laptop i had a desktop in my office i didn't like a laptop if you got to carry the stuff it's very very heavy 4 to 5 kg those days you got to plug it in and you know the power goes off sometime then you got to boot it up and you got to do all that i didn't like that you know it's all in my head all the figures in my head but when i had an ipad it's so easy just press the start button and everything comes on and you click you're there and look at the beauty of the design look at an iphone look at the beauty of the design correct and because of the sheer beauty and the simplicity of the entire thing millions of people are using it because billions of people want ease of use they don't want complexity today when you look at a tv set in the console there's so many things you don't use that and i find it very confusing i just want to know how to put it on how to change the channel and how to put the sound up 
There's so many things, you know, screen within screen. None of us use that, right? But they put it as complexity. I hope they're able to, uh, you know, just make the TV listen to you. Suppose you have a TV where you speak and say, "Hey, I want to see cricket." Okay, here are the channels. Okay, show me what is happening. You know, it's very discovery, right? They're going to come to that. So, design is extremely important to have that consumer experience, and then. the way you do it simplicity is also part of the design and then innovation comes because you have a solution which doesn't exist which is then put on uh, put below design to and the design makes it very easy to use thank you so much by the design amazing uh, points uh, thank you so much uh, you know uh, mr pai uh, for those kind uh, thoughts uh, anurag go uh, back to you when yeah, it's, it's fascinating mr pai I must tell you, gave us the example of the iPad. I haven't used a laptop in I think eight nine years. I carry my iPad. Uh, I know there's a limitation of storing files. You can put an external thing in and you can store it. Uh, it's so it's so light. It's so convenient. Uh, it is even made for Corona times because we do a lot of video. So you know, it, it is a perfect analogy. And now you have larger screens in them. So if you want a larger screen, you want that experience. Uh, even that exists. Now let me ask you. uh you know in 2034 uh as per past estimates the world will achieve singularity and there is a singularity in university right and who knows singularity with the advent of corona may happen faster where machines and human beings on some things have similar uh, thought processes and machines are able to figure out what humans want now tell us post corona and in the singularity kind of environment what are the new things that have got added in terms of skills that are required and hence the shifts in educational institutions for example the need for a hybrid education you know i don't think it will be completely digital or completely physical on the campus it has to be a combination of hybrid what is your view on it before i bring supreet Well, I think you know people are talking about singularity when machines will be capable of doing what human beings can do, where machines are capable of having intelligence. Well, let us wait for that. But one thing is very certain: machines can possibly do 30, 40 percent of what we can do because machines can do rule-based work very, very efficiently. That's why we have big machines which can beat people in chess, in the Go game, and everything else, right? And why is that? Because machines are able to process data. much faster they don't get tired you know they're not they're not physical i mean organic creatures like us they're physical but not organic creatures like us and that will come to a time when machines will be able to have intelligence and do things on their own and that moment is it going to come well it may come but i think the key thing is for all of us all of us is a very scary experience because imagine a time when there are robots working in the factory in the factory robots working in the farm there are autonomous vehicles who don't require drivers you go to a restaurant there are robots who come and serve you and they understand what you want you go to the kitchen there are robots who can do that for you you go to a bus the bus drives by itself you go to an airport possibly the airport is fully automated you don't see people except people who want to travel so what are we supposed to do what are the rest of us supposed to do because 80 90% of us do very routine jobs we go to an office do a routine job and come home at 5 or 6 and we are very happy we don't think we don't do things like that we go to a factory and for people do very routine jobs and they come back and they do it now is it a good thing for society if singularity comes well i don't know it may be a bad thing because there are too many people floating around but what is certain is singularity is going to come or will come at a point of time maybe 2034 maybe 2035 now in the meantime what are we supposed to do well first of all i think the total work that human beings do will come down anurag the total quantum of work will come down for example anurag when you had covid we all stayed at home and worked right what happened to cab drivers what happened to bus drivers what happened to so many people who working right we didn't go to restaurant we didn't go to movie theater we didn't go everywhere else all that came so i think it will it will work then what happened we all did e-commerce we did everything else that means the distribution channel shifted to new models there were still people but the quantum of people got reduced because the choices were in centralized in a particular place and not dependent on location right so these are going to happen so there are going to be social issues i don't want to dwell on that for right now but what we should do as individuals is to have the capacity to change and face change do we have the capacity to change to face change do you have the capacity to get along 
and do we have the capacity to understand and how to respond to change in a short period of time the younger people have that as you get older you get set in your ways so now the big danger is for people who are 35 to 50 35 to 50 because hopefully after 50 you are set you got a little bit of money and you can save and work 50 you are in danger of being replaced by an army of young people who can work do whatever you do at a fraction of the cost that you do so i think it's very important for that people in that age group to learn how to change and to face change and to keep learning and that's why self learning more and more learning understanding new things understanding how to work in new technology is going to be the key and my personal view is the people are going to be ahead are the people who can run faster than others everybody is not going to succeed but you want to succeed you got to run faster than others and forget about the rest somebody will take care of the rest so i think it is extremely important for all of us to understand this message because singularity is good and also frightening is also frightening is very very frightening and yes, that's why yes. in many societies in iraq people are talking about basic income and the concept is very simple each person will have a robo the robo will work for him or her and the robo will get money and the money will be credited to your account and there will be a tax in the robo and the robo will be like your avatar right so supreet will have a robo you will have a robo the robo will do all your work and if something is stuck the robo will come and ask you so you can spend your time sitting by the beach and sipping a drink or looking at the sun and looking at who is around you and doing whatever you want so i think is <laughs> so that the only thing that you can do when we all get replaced okay so prudh you clearly refer to 35 to body 50 you clearly are on the right side of that number not on the wrong side so any murita was said to us so clearly supreet uh, what thing is the need two things are very important one is entrepreneurship uh, which a lot of people in india have started to take as an option the other is employability i want to ask you and then take this question to mr pai before we start taking audience question and close how do we improve the mindset uh, about entrepreneurship because you know dhoni came from a very small town right uh, so did vijay shekhar sharma and we can go on but in small towns still the minds of of entrepreneurship doesn't exist i think uh, we have a live example amongst us you know mr pai himself right you know he, he started from udupi sir if i am not not wrong right so no no i am a bengalurian oh, you are from bengaluru small city right. long ago yeah long long ago yes so i i don't think it's about the uh, geo location uh, anymore i think it's it's largely about uh, mind over mindset right you know if you want to look at let me give you another example you know a, a batchmate of mine actually a uh, senior alumni uh, where i studied in iim bangalore you know this was uh, mustafa who came from a place uh, and his parents were probably not even uh, you know fresh uh, id fresh one yeah the the id special you know he probably did not even know what is iimb when he he did not know the significance of what is iimb when he joined iim right he went on to create one of the you know largest uh, and the Uh, the, the he revolution the entire food uh, you know business in in india and why why is in india you know he was about to his company was about to be picked up at about 24 crores you know one of the teachers actually you know it was uh, divya cheshari one of our professors who actually kindled his brain saying why not 1500 crores and why not look at process innovation uh, by looking at various designs today you have id no, no longer is standing for just uh, idli or, or a dosa batter you know there are, he's innovated the entire chain of how he prepares different products and it uh, goes to the market whether it's coffee whether it's parathas or something else but it's it's automation and design at its best to meet the lowest common denominator in the society in the nick of time that matters and that's the uh, mindset you know He, he probably started off with, uh, you know, a year's salary, and then he started off, uh, and today he's he's leading the, uh, you know, charts in most of the uh, areas that he's looking at. So there are multiple such uh, examples that we could look at. Oyo, for that matter, you know, which is our Indian version of, uh, you know, uh, various design-led innovations that we are seeing in the market as well. Thank you, Supri, uh, Mr. Pai. Why we talk of entrepreneurship innovation? We still have a lot of graduates passing out, and their employability is an issue. What can be done to improve employability? You know, my my view is uh, Anurag. Employability can only increase if you give them the freedom to do things and don't bind them too much. And each one finds an area of interest and works on that. 
for example look at mustafa which uh, supri said i mean he was working in a you know creating the idli batter something idli batter is we'll say it's a stupid thing it's a small low tech thing but look at what he did in terms of automating in terms of becoming the provider of idli and dosa batter to a lot of people all over just in time i mean he created a whole industry right so you know everybody knew what it was nobody gave much time to it but he created an industry so i think people are naturally entrepreneurial here everybody is entrepreneurial because all of us solve problems especially in a country like india where so many things don't work right we make them work and you see it happening all the time the key is to understand how to make it efficient how to scale it up and for that people should start doing things now anurag we have to understand everybody cannot be entrepreneurial in a class of 100 maybe 15 20 can be entrepreneurial rest cannot be entrepreneurial let's be very clear about it is only for people who have that interest to do things because most people want to take it easy too they want to have a nice cool job, maybe a government job because you know when you talk when you join government you get a pension on the first day not salary because you can they can't kick you out so everybody many people want that but the key thing is and there are a set of people who are curious so give them the opportunity challenge them talk to them and give them a little bit of money as a grant to go try it out and give them the freedom to experiment and tell them like uh, one of you said that if you fail is fine because if you fail you understood what doesn't work there are 100 things you tried one it doesn't work you understood that other people haven't even tried that to know that it doesn't work that means they're going to repeat that mistake now you got to know the mistake you learn what will not work and what will work so give them the flexibility to give them small grants ask them to go ahead and kindle that and i'm sure that a lot lot more will succeed because luckily anura we live in a society where there are so many problems we are a large country with so many problems a huge market which is developing there are not many things which are already there which can stifle you right so many many things can come and we are on the cusp of great technological change where everything that you do in everyday life is getting challenged and everything is blowing up and doing being being done very differently now you spoke about vijay shekhar sharma coming from a small town well well vijay was very curious he wanted to do certain things he had enormous energy you know energy curiosity willingness to take a risk with somebody else well somebody gave him a lot of money and took a lot of risk and he succeeded to somewhat so i think it's very important to have all that and that comes now when you have an entrepreneurial idea why will people take a risk on you because they see your enthusiasm they see your energy they see your communication they see what you're doing and the chain the disruption can become so you must learn to communicate you must learn to put on your passion to somebody else if you're able to do that it will work very well so i think you know Uh, innovation can be done in an open collegial system like i said and that's what entrepreneurship can be done there and that's what universities and colleges should just open up give people a chance and challenge them and i'm sure many many people will come out to be entrepreneurs i just heard that uh, in the iits today uh, as against 70% wanting to go overseas maybe 15 years ago only 15 20% want to go overseas and 50 60% want to work in startups and the large number want to become entrepreneurs that's 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 a that's a good sign uh there are about six questions seven questions let me bring those questions in at this point uh let me bring in the first question from mr gopal krishna murthy padpati he is uh, mr pj ki murthy he is from parul university and he asks how are the aims of new education policy in respect to making primary and secondary school education um happen So he's saying, how will we meet meet the goals that the new education policy has set up? What are the changes need to be brought in teachers training? So he is focusing on saying, while we need to focus on what we need to focus, what about reorienting teachers? Yeah. You know, uh, Anurag, let me ask a question. What is the difference between a good school and a bad school? A good school defined as a school which gives a superior product. I'm using a business jargon. the difference between a good school and a bad school is a good headmaster and headmistress is the leader now india has got some 16 lakh schools okay that means 16 lakh headmasters headmistresses are there now new education policy should give them the freedom to innovate and the freedom to do many things and to learn on the job that means they require some training they require some education re education how to do things systematically people at the top should reduce the workload for all the students and start working to make things happen better and better and it can be done immediately i was in another conclave where people are saying oh with the new education policy we will see the output only maybe you know 
10 12 years from now i said no you can see the output after two or three years why is that existing schools can change so i think every headmaster every school teacher should read the new education policy the government and others who control the boards should make sure that uh, they start opening up and reducing the load and then they must start changing some things and i think the prime minister has come uh, gone public to say they're starting a new unit uh, with the government to open up the curriculum do things much better they want to start doing from next year so my advice is read the policy within your classroom see how to be more creative cut down the load talk to your to talk to your headmasters and start working thank you so breathe there are many questions uh, and uh, of course some i won't take i don't think that like sm naga in the full is saying why we all consider that there is no scope for mechanical engineering that's an exact you know assumption there is a lot of scope but let me take two questions which are relevant to our discussion one it is about vocational education amit gupta is asking yeah. what do you think of vocational education and how, how do you think it will evolve over the next couple of years um, uh, one of my favorites too is, is the vocational education space. You know, uh, we've always been talking about the formal education system in a very broad context, very focused way. But we've forgotten that you know our gross enrollment ratio in a uh, in a country is probably the uh, you know lowest when you look at our own what we've done in the past to what what we're currently doing and what we could potentially do. So you know, if, if I were to look at it from an opportunity minus minus standpoint in, in education in the system. And given the uh, super express highway like technology platforms that we all have today, I think vocational is the clear answer to all of these uh, problems. You know, it, let me take an example. You know, somebody sitting in Vadodara who wants to probably learn, you know, how do I uh, look at design thinking and, you know, probably creative, uh, you know, education for himself. And there's probably hardly anything uh, in, in, in that city and he can't go for a full-time course but he also has to study or, and, and work at the same time the simplest thing that to do is to go online and do a short-term program for six months pick up a skill apply it in the uh, real field and then come back again for a you know a re-education and this is a common thing in most of the other countries you know if you look at Australia as a country where TAFE, you know, the average age of anybody enrolling into vocational education, the top skills in demand is on an average anywhere between 23 to 28. Unlike in our country where it's a marriage age, you know, for girls and probably for boys at around 28, 29, and they would they should have been in some jobs. But if you if you apply it in the other way around, you know, in, in terms of what are the uh, experiences that I need before I identify what are the problem statements that I would like to tackle, you need to dirty your hands first, which is that you know you, you gotta go and work in, in after you finish your college and at the same time figure a way out to how do you learn some skills. It doesn't probably need to be a degree at all. And and if I were to look at uh, you know what are the top uh, trends and what are the top skills that are going in 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 the overall digital as a space today, I think there are umpteen number of opportunities, whether it is design, a web, a video, augmented realities, immersive technologies. Uh, you know, various forms of uh, teaching, you know, education technology is today opened up so much that uh, every graduate today has got a potential to become a teacher because every 10th person needs to be a student in, a, in our country. So vocational education is definitely a big thing. It's it's already a big thing and it's going to, you know, uh, grow in a multiplier uh, of maybe 10x or more in the next coming years. It's, it's definitely here to stay. Thank you. Mr. Pai, uh, there is Parminder Mr. Chaudhary. I am Parminder lecture. I am a lecturer in a college. My question is, what are the skills I should invest in to sustain myself over the next 10, 15 years? How do I reinvent? <laughs> the teacher is asking, how do I reinvent myself? You scared well, the her. First thing, the first thing you, know to, you need to know is to understand what is the latest innovative things happening in the area where you teach. You are teaching a subject. What are the latest information, latest things happening? Second thing that you need to know is to improve your communication skills and your teaching skills to make sure the students are interested in what you do. Third, you need to know, you need to relearn pedagogy to make sure you teach in a manner that the people understand and people respect you much more. And fourth is to find out areas which are interesting to you and learn some new skills just for the sake of learning skills. By doing all this, you know, you will be ahead of the rest 
and that should be adequate for you to succeed as a teacher or something else in case you want to go to some other area pointer anurag ji parmeshwar so um once a learner always a learner is something that you know we are taught uh, in uh, corporate life and and i think uh, you know miss pai would also embody it being a leader in the uh, you know people experience as a business every 90 days you know if we don't reinvent yourself you know by reflecting on thoughts i i think we we would defeat the purpose of innovation in whatever we are trying to do and hence the necessity for you know unlearn and relearn part of it uh, you know as an area and i i would request you know mr pai if there are any best practices sir that i think you can share both as a uh, you know people leader uh, from a corporate standpoint and also from an academic standpoint and i think it's important for uh, the leaders uh, part, participating in this uh, you know event today to understand what does it take to create an institution of excellence like manipal and also create uh, you know an an organization of par eminence uh, like uh, infosys there are two different boards but i think there are a lot of common threads uh, which is people and excellence in in the getting people to deliver first of all supreet i think you should develop a vision of saying that you want to be the best you want to be the best in this field not the largest not the biggest but the best and what is the best to set standards to set standards in education set standards in pedagogy set standards in projects etc so that you become much more attractive to others second look at the tools that are required to empower people to set standards now the most important thing again is an open transparent collegial culture a culture where everybody is welcome everybody is wanted everybody has space to grow within certain constraints so the culture is important the culture should break down hierarchy the culture should break down the fear of talking back the fear of not explaining to everybody so you become very collegial when people work together in one team and people are secure the next thing is to give people the tools by which they can improve themselves and become productive in their areas of expertise and the fourth is to have a review mechanism where people set up goals for themselves and then they come back and say how they have achieved what they have done because we do need goal setting we do need reviews to make sure that we move and in case of difficulty and the next thing is create a mentor system where people can have somebody to go talk to in case they require help and the last thing is make sure that your reward and recognition system is very transparent so that people feel satisfied they are not dissatisfied so creating this culture helping people have these tools setting standards and having the desire for excellence will over a period of time transform everything and in the university you must give people the faculty the space to grow well ideally the faculty should be able to design the course every year like american used to do it we don't have the system here but within whatever constraint they are you give them the freedom to operate and the freedom to work and how to work etc so remove the control system that are there and i think you you'll be a much much better different institution that's what we did in manipal over the last 10 15 years and that's why we come to the stage of a institute of national eminence and we've been doing that in infosys right from the time when we were having revenues of 3 million dollars and just yesterday uh, i read something which made me happy which i started off uh, you know way back in uh, 2007 uh, sustainability uh, infosys become carbon neutral in 2007 we had this desire that we got to be carbon neutral we got to make sure that we uh, we are sustainable and we took so many steps all that committee cumulated made that company is a very large company 250000 people with about 13 and a half billion dollars of revenue 65 billion dollar market value to say that look we are carbon neutral today it is fantastic and all the steps that it took i think has paid off but you know there were small steps improved every year we did better and better and better and today we have that so i think is a culture to be the most important thing is a culture within an organization thank you so much uh, mr pai we couldn't have had a better person to talk about uh, you know what can be done to reinvent every stakeholder in the education ecosystem and you gave perfect examples my takeaway is culture is the most important thing second is what do you aim at what is your vision and supreet uh, thank you for being in a perspective from technology from innovation from design thinking and yes you're right we need to be lifelong learners there are more questions uh, about 12 more questions but it's five we are two past five so i would like to thank uh, both mr pai and both uh, 
uh, Mr. Supreet Nagarajan for joining us. All our audience, we've had 90% of our audience on Zoom uh, in the end of October still there. And we had another 600 people joining on Facebook and Twitter. So thank you so much, uh, Mr. Pai. Uh, I'm sure a lot of the stakeholders who came from the education ecosystem benefited from what you said and they'll implement a bit of what, at least a bit of what, if not all of what you said, I'm sure you opened up their mind. Thank you, Sipreet, for asking fantastic questions and being a change agent in this ecosystem. I'd like to thank all the audience and say goodbye. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sipreet. Thank you, Anurag. Thank you, Tani. Bye-bye.